evening, everybody, and um, thank you all for coming to this discussion on philanthropy in India. And it's deliberately a question saying, is it a quality model? Because the answer, you're going to have to give it to us at the end of this discussion. Um, while the tradition of philanthropy has existed for centuries, there's a renewed interest in public, in public discussion about the topic, partly generated by the setting up of the Buffett Gates Foundation. Philanthropy in India is as ancient as the country itself. However, the concept of phil philanthropy in India is often misunderstood, even by Indians themselves. We have with us today three people who have been closely involved with philanthropy in India. Our key speaker this evening is Mr. Shiv Nadar. He has a first-hand experience of having built up an institution from nothing to a $6 billion global enterprise, hiring about 100,000 people around the world. But today he's not going to speak to us about HCL. He's going to speak to us about something he's investing as much time in, in setting up, which is the foundation. And besides that, he also personally understands from his own life experience the concept of creative philanthropy, which is what he's going to talk to us to today. I'm just going to introduce all of them at the beginning so that there are no interruptions. So after Mr. Nadar, we'll have Mr. Anwar Hassan, who's the managing director of Tata Limited in London. I got interested in philanthropy as a concept through my first conversations with him about five years ago. And he's going to talk to us about the Tata model of philanthropy. And we also have with us Dweep, Dweep from UBS, who's been working on philanthropic research also in the context of European experiences. So he's going to um, give a broader perspective. So over to you, Mr. Nadar. See the screen, and if you want us to move, just put up your hand. Or good evening. About philanthropy, I got to start thinking about it sometime in 1994. What had happened at the time was we had sold a fourth of our computer business interests to HP and we had some funds in our bank. And I was very enthusiastically planning ahead on what to do with that money for the businesses. At the time, my mother had come to stay with me and she quietly asked, said, are you just going to continue to build enterprises? I said, yes. It's a great fulfillment of what I wanted to do. She said, do you want to do something about sharing? I thought that it was too early to get started with that. 93, you must remember that India was just about opening up. We were not really confident about our own wealth, whatever we created. She said, if you keep waiting, it's like standing in front of a sea and waiting for all the sea to subside, the waves to subside before you go to swim. So this is never going to happen. Why did you just get started? I shared a wonderful relationship with my mother. I never second-guessed her. So I thought if she says so, this must be right. That is the time I started thinking about what to do. When I was brainstorming this with my wife and my mother, my daughter was too young at the time, she was just 12. Uh, she said, why didn't you just think of education because it's a great cause. 
I thought about it more. This is the way in my mind the model fell. I don't know how many of you are aware. Uh, India's, amongst India's education institution, the one which had the most stunning impact were the Indian Institutes of Technology. These were very surprisingly a model thought through in London during the British rule. And a paper was generated by the then Viceroy. This was in 1946. And they proposed to set up the Indian Institutes of Technology. Finally, it came to being in 1951. The Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, started its way. And it just opened, along with education, simultaneously research. It was started with great aspirations. And it has stood all the way correct to what it was founded for. There were four more IITs that were created. And they created tremendous, deep, sustaining, and stunning impact. Till then, the only way a highly aspiring person could do in India was to join the Indian Administrative Service, which was a successor to the Indian Civil Service. You virtually ruled India. Even today, if someone who rules India, it's not the political parties, it's the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is consisting of every district head is from the Indian Administrative Service. India is divided to about a thousand districts. That's a fulcrum of everything. Something like a billion dollars worth of GDP goes through each of these districts every year. So you're talking about very vast sums of money. And the state being the largest philanthropist, whether it is in terms of education or healthcare or old age or any social cause, it goes through them. Next to that came the Indian Institute of Technology because many thousands of people appeared for the Indian Administrative Service that they selected only 120 of them. 10 of them went to the Indian Foreign Service and the rest of them went through the Administrative Service in India. IITs were broader based, it offered a commercial job, and you have to visualize a era which is socialistic. You've got to go back to 50s. It was all over India's, you know, kind of skipped the, the benefits of industrial revolution, but they were trying to catch up. You know, uh, first prime minister felt that the temples of India would be the manufacturing sites. And the five-year plans were made, and the engineer shortage was going to be there. They picked the best and the brightest through a competitive exam, completely unadulterated, which stood the test of time till today. I know it very well because, as of now, I'm the chairman of the first Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. What did the Indian Institute of Technology create? When it created aspirations and when the students started passing out and going to many places. Every fifth of them became global citizens and lived in many parts of the world. That raised what a middle class person wanted his son or daughter to be. Because they pass, up, pass this out, it's a world class institution chosen purely on merit. It lands a student earning from job till retirement anything from two to three million rupees in India, and globally, it could be substantially larger. So I thought I would go up and create one more IIT. There were only five so far. So we went about and created an institution which would be not merely education, but an academy of leadership. So the model difference between whatever anyone else thought of and what we thought of was, in time, it will become an academy of leadership. It started going, and through this period, something we thought in our foundation was, 
education would be a necessary condition after that leadership is a sufficient condition and what would be desirable the desirable condition should be it must create a force multiplier and it must create spirals of aspiration force multiplier spirals of aspiration we knew it was several years later now, i was very comfortable with doing anything that may happen 10 years later or 20 years later or 30 years later because i would set it going i was always confident someone will come up and pick it up and take it further i was just telling him he said is it still growing i just counted in the second year of hcl we did 3.1 crores i don't know those of you of indian background will know what is a crore a crore is 10 million rupees so it was 31 million rupees last year we completed 31000 crores you know it's something like 10000 times that quantum over a period of little more than 30 years did i visualize it no but did i hope for it yes we built it to get there we thought that what is the next layer next level to which we could go and build even more impactful you know the impact has to be deep and the impact has to be stunning if the indian institute of technologies i would say absolutely stunning impact because based on that only engineering education grew in india today there are 5000 engineering colleges half a million engineers come out of the place and if you count them up their gdp which they generate exceeds the gdp of uk or france or india for that matter because they are there all over the world creating this wealth and creating this jobs doing good to what the society looks for or earns for i was familiar with education from another front when india was growing in computers it sorely lacked people who could write programs today it must be funny for you because indians write programs for virtually every computer everywhere in the world at that time for india itself it was not available i personally went and tried to argue it out with the department of education in the union ministry as well as to the union uh the university grants commission which controls all the universities they said no that that's too crass we will teach how to design computers but not really write programs in them so the only way out is that we are going to create an institution of our own so we went and created an institution it's called national institute of information technology nait i founded that actually and this became you know historically it became the first listed company in it services in india it listed 15 days before infosys did and it became the first billion dollar market cap company in india in it services and almost the same month in which infosys also did i had to quit the company because i had conflict of interest so i sold the stakes and instead i put it in more social philanthropic moves so thinking about this what would we do next we reviewed this in 2007 by which time the institution which we created the foundation generated in the state of tamil nadu had already come on rank par with any of the iits deep thinking a lot of think tank work a lot of debate created you know jane you know we could see that there is a vacuum in the school education for similar inspiring work then we had to pick we built our company in the state of uttar pradesh i don't know how many of you are familiar with this uttar pradesh is a state which is north east of new delhi it's a very populous state it has 200 million people largely living in rural parts of india rural parts of uttar pradesh 
something like 70% of them live in that area. That's 14, 440 million people. Yeah. This is an area which is pretty much the unlit portion of Uttar Pradesh. Education is very bad. No matter in what way you measure it, you know, they may be going to school is not identically equal to uh, gaining education. The education has to be imparted as much as it should be absorbed. And if we have education with half the students who are going to the fifth standard, unable to read or write, then you are having a serious issue of illiteracy. So we had the rural India and rural UP more, women even more strongly, just couldn't find a good bearing, good seeds as they began their lives. This was going to be a true sociological disaster. This is the largest state, four-fifths of our time as India has been generated by prime ministers who came from that state, excepting the recent, you know, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. And the state is the shape in which it is, the education. So we thought that what do we do here to create some foundations? Foundation of education is too vast. It's truly the job of the state. And they're trying to do whatever the best that they can. <coughs> what can we do? We again went back to, if we have to create leadership, we have to build academies of leadership for the very bottom of the pyramid. So where does the real bottom of the pyramid lie in India or in UP? It lies in rural states rural districts, rural villages. And where do they go to school? The schools are by the village heads, which are called village panchayats. These are panchayat schools run by the government. So we thought we would pick students through merit, exactly how IITs pick students through merit. Fifth standard, the government runs an exam, CBSC exam, and there's a marking system which creates a uniformity. So we felt that we would go and launch one of the largest search processes for these school students. Fifth standard, outgoing student, 10 year old, boys and girls. Girls should be at least 40%. We went looking for it, it's a theory. If we can pick them, let's say one to 10,000, they will be as good. You know, if you take the intellect, if you take the capabilities, they'll be as good as any in the world. It's too large a sample when you pick amongst this larger population. Okay. We worked with the state government and worked with the district administration launching a very large search process, first year, which is three years ago. We picked out of 2,000 schools, we picked two school toppers. We picked 200 students, boys and girls. Now, how do we create an equivalent of a school? You know, I have been very largely influenced of leadership development by some of the universities and schools of the Western society. What do you happen? Yeah. Can you just put up that slide? I'm going in a different sequence. So. Now we've got to go to this. See, when you go through these great institutions, what did they really create? Do they just impart education?
if you see Oxford University, the number of prime ministers it has created, I don't have that number here. Do you have it here? Let, let me just get you this subject anyway. If you take Oxford University, or if you take Eton, if you take Harrow, Oxford has created 28 British Prime Ministers. Nine members of the British Cabinet now, 117 members of the House of Commons, over 140 members of the House of Lords. Bill Clinton, at least one former US President, and Manmohan Singh, Prime Minister of India. Indira Gandhi, former Prime Minister of India. You go to Harrow, you go to Eton, you go to London School of Economics. They're all great institutions. Do they merely impart education? No. They seem to be doing something which is creating and cultivating leadership. We felt that this is what we need to recreate in this state, not just merely impart education to them because that's a war which someone else has to fight. But if we pick the best of this nature, we want them to become leaders in science, leaders in teaching, leaders in law, leaders in economists. If we were to pick them up, they have to come from the best of the lot. So if we search out and go and pick the best of the lot, then we have to give pretty much a world-class institution. We formed the school three years ago, and my basic norm was the school should be good enough for my daughter to have gone there. So it set the standard very high. And if you see India's elite schools, like the Dune School, if you compare, if you compare it with Mayo, they're all very well-endowed schools. They are the ones from whom the leadership of India has evolved. If you just take Dune School, one school, a series of cabinet ministers, one prime minister, two chief ministers, several admirals and generals, they really built leadership there. This is what we set out to build, but one of the things is it must have the best of facilities, best of faculty, it needed to be residential. See, it's a, it's a very deeply impacting social experiment, taking the students who are pretty close to the bottom of the pyramid, relocating them in a place. You have to see they come from places where they, pretty much all of them are below poverty line families. Those who didn't have probably one set of clothes that to hand me down, come here to a place where they change clothes four times because you get up in the morning and you're onto your yoga or something and then you go into your class, then go into your sports, you go into your dancing or any of these facilities. But whatever we do, whether it is faculty or position or the facilities, it'll be the best in class. Take a look at what the school looks like. This is this boy getting very combative. <laughs> <laughs> 
can see it. This girl's name is Lakshmi. She scores 99% virtually in everything. This doesn't do justice to how nice this campus really looks. I was there for yesterday. Some update, 30% of the students score more than 90% and 80% of the students score more than 80%. You can see the level at which the students are performing. These exams are fairly objective the way we have built them. And day for yesterday was a sports day, it was strange. Clocked, they clocked the boy who was running, this 12-year-old boy, who was running 100 meters. I thought he was fast. Wearing canvas shoes, now these are not really running shoes. 11.9 seconds, I thought it was pretty good. With good coaching, he could get somewhere. Now, I want to, after this, show you something. These kids will come through well, but what is the impact they are having from where they come from? As I told you, our points are all about aspiration spirals.
This girl, actually, when she joined the school, she didn't want to continue. She thought she'll run away from the school because it was just too far away from parents. You've got to see the social background from which they come. And this is as far as she's come now. There is a long way to go. This is just the very beginning of a new social experiment, which shows every sign of being very successful. Our goal is how do we build force multipliers? How do we build further spirals of inspiration? You could see in her village, there are 30,000 people who live there. And if you take the surrounding villages, there'll be quite a few. They're very enthused by each of these girls going there. Our second school got going this year in Sitapur, that's north of Lucknow. And the third school, year after late, next it'll begin in uh, Varnasi. These are all pretty remote parts of UP where these are being built. The goal which Roshni, my daughter, as the president of this institution, has is that in 15 years' time from beginning, 10,000 students should come out of this. And her goal is that every single person coming out of the school should touch a thousand lives touch, inspire, and worked out a phase two program, how to make their lives meaningful. It's a very large goal, but I do believe it's eminently doable. That is pretty much what I had to say. I think let's skip the next one. Time is up. Do we have another five minutes? I want to show you audiovisual of somebody who studied through scholarship. Uh, this is in our engineering system in the south. This is what we really meant by the multiplier effect, the change multiplier. Now, Senthil Nathan's goal is that he would set up at least 100 scholarships. And he's working in the US. I've seen him in his first year, and I saw him recently in November last year. He's completely changed you know, in the last seven, eight years. But, well, that's what we are there for. You know, we are there just to make these changes occur. We have set up a big number for ourselves, and it's a plan. Like all plans, the devil is in the impl implementation. I thought it will be a model which will be interesting for all of you to hear of, because it's not just education. It's not just a leadership academy. It's about how to create these spirals. Thank you.
you, Mr. Nader. That was very inspiring. And now we have Mr. Hassan. Friends, <clears throat> after that kind of a talk which brought a lump into your throat, I think it's difficult to sort of follow through with a fluent kind of a lecture, but I'll give it a good try. Um, I'm glad <clears throat> Mr. Nader spoke before me because a lot of things that he said is really figuring in my little talk also in the sense that there is a lot of similarities between what he and Roshni has done to what uh, Jamshidji Tata when he started off and what his sons did, which was basically to carry on uh, the legacy of what the founder of the group, Mr. Shivnader in this case, and I think Roshni after that. And I guess after Roshni there will be somebody else to carry it on. And I think this is really the secret of uh, an enduring uh, kind of a philanthropy, which uh, sometimes people don't get to sort of know the importance of. So I will tell you about the Tata story, uh, which uh, in Mr. Shivnada's case, it is an actual ongoing uh, situation. In my thing, I've got to go back to 1880, where this whole Tata story of philanthropy started. But I think before we uh, talk about philanthropy, I think we need to know what philanthropy means. It's from a Greek word called I mean, when I say it, it sounds like philanthropy, but it is spelled F-I-L-A-N-T-R-A-P-I, which means love of mankind. You know, charity is something that anybody can give to anybody. Charity is something that's uh, very, you know, uh, one-dimensional. Philanthropy is something that <clears throat> which you do for the love of mankind, and it has to be much more enduring, and and that is like mankind is ever enduring, so I think your philanthropy needs to sort of follow in that. <clears throat> Jamshedji Tata, the founder of the Tata group and his sons, were products of an era where adventurous young men made large fortunes by exploiting the scientific discoveries and inventions of the 19th and early 20th century. I guess in that case, Mr. Shivnadar also has taken advantage of the IT, and I think he's now created the kind of wealth that perhaps uh, Mr. Jamshidji Tata had done during his time, right? Now, Mr. Tata made a lot of money and in trading and uh, those kind of uh, uh, businesses in textiles, and I think he could have sat back and said, look, let me make much more money, and you know, after all, my I'm a businessman, and business is my business, so I need to sort of continue in that. Much like what Mr. Nader would have done had it not been for his mother in saying that what are you going to do with the money. I think the inner voice in Mr. Tata did also feel that now that you've made this kind of money, what are you going to do with it? And I think he um, was inspired, he was self-inspiring kind of this thing. And <clears throat> instead he saw under the exploitation of colonial rule, his country was being bypassed the industrial revolution. Now he felt very strongly about industrial power. He felt that any country that had to be great had to have industrial powers. So that's what took him to steel, that's what took him to energy, and that's what took him to, uh, took him to those kind of directions. So he decided that he should apply his fortune to launch India on the path of modern science and technology, much like what's happened here in the school that has been created. And what does this school do? It creates people who will really get the benefits and give back to society. Uh, at the same time, he inculcated a sense of social conscience and trusteeship in his sons and family, an outlook that has become characteristic of the Tata group. You know, Jamshidji Tata felt that in a free enterprise, the community is just not another stakeholder in our business. It, but is in fact the very purpose of the existence of our enterprises. So when you get into have that kind of a mental frame of mind, there are things that follow naturally. Jamshedji lived in an age before tax benefits when philanthropy was its own reward. He looked at the application of wealth about the same time as his contemporaries Carnegie and Rockefeller. You know, um, uh, although Jamshedji's wealth was on a much smaller scale. Rockefeller and Carnegie had the advantage of operating in a climate of freedom. 
you know, I mean, there were no bars to, uh, to stop them from doing whatever, is the, whatever they wanted to. But <clears throat> Mr. Tata, in a rapidly developing industrial society, Jamshedji, on the other hand, had to operate in a climate of servitude in an agrarian economy whose industry has been drained by foreign rulers to provide a market for exports and for the imperial power. Whilst he, was, whilst he was sensitive to the suffering of the people, he realized that patchwork philanthropy, which is uh, another way of saying that it's another form of, um, well, charity, giving some food here and some clothes there would not go far. He had a philosophy of constructive philanthropy. <clears throat> what, uh, what advances a nation or a community is not so much to prop up its weakest and ha hapless members but to lift up the best and most gifted so as to enable them to greater service to the country. And with this end, mind in end, he launched the various uh, trusts which sort of gave the JN Tata Endowment Scheme for Higher Education in 1892, sending abroad future doctors, administrators, scientists, and doctors and lawyers, something like what Mr. Nader is doing here at his school to create that kind of a um, uh, talent. <clears throat> then he created the University of Science and Technology, now Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, to give India technological personnel that would enable it to step it into the industrial age. Thus the tradition of Tata philanthropy <clears throat> was set by Jamshedpur, the founder of the, of the Ta Tata group. The grand vision was his, but to his sons, Dorab and Ratan, and his cousin Diyadi, goes the credit of continuing the tradition, which is what I'm saying is that the most important thing, it cannot be in one generation, it has to continue. And what Mr. Nader talked about, things coming to fruition in 10, 15, 30 years time, that can only happen if there is that continuity, if that legacy is continued. And I think in Dorab Tata and Ratan Tata, he had the people who carried out his vision and they themselves not only did what his father, what the father set out to do, but they said they themselves on their own uh, encouraged and enabled a lot of the things that have happened. <clears throat> the wealth gathered by Jamshedji and his son in half a century of industrial pioneering formed but a minute fraction of the amount by which they enriched the nation. The whole of that wealth is held in trust by the people and used exclusively for their benefit. The cycle is thus complete. What came from the people in terms of profits that this company has, the companies have made, goes back to the people many times over. Now, that's the kind of philosophy that, you know, keeps the trust going. Sir Ratan died in 1918, and as per his terms of his will, the Sir Ratan Tata Trust was set up in 1919. Sir Dorab Tata Trust was registered in March 1932, and the settler Sodharab died in June of the same year. The wealth he turned over to the trust included substantial sales in Tata Sons, India Hotels, and other allied companies, and jewelry valued at one crore in 1932. I mean, I'm saying all this is because, just to tell you, it's everything that was theirs, lock, stock, and barrel, was something that was put into the trust. I think nothing uh, symbolizes more as to what he meant about his own charity is he thought that uh, he had, uh, you know, his wealth included a 245 carat jubilee uh, diamond, which was twice as large as the Kohinoor. Now he felt that a diamond in a vault is just another diamond. Sold and its proceeds intelligently harnessed, it can enrich the lives of thousands. Both trusts together broke out of the customary constraints of community. Now, this is a very important thing. I mean, you had a lot of trusts which obviously favored um, certain aspects of society, but to them, I think they made it a principle that they broke out of the customary constraints of community, religion, common features of most trusts those days. Both rank and the largest Indian foundation, both were multi-purpose institutions, and both sought suitable venues for their activities. It will be interesting to, you know, people sometimes ask me, um, um, who do you work for? And, um, so I say that I work for a charity. So they don't quite understand what that means. So I told them I work for the Tatas. 
So he says, but that's not a charity. So I said, yes, in a manner of speaking it is. Because when you look at Tata's, you look at the parent body, which is Tata Sons. And 66% of Tata Sons is owned by two trusts. The Ratan Tata Trust and the Dorab Tata Trust. So 66% of all the dividends and all the incomes that flow from the companies that the Tatas run goes to these two trusts. And it is these trusts that then farm out the money to various charitable organizations. And in the process of all these years, they have built up institutions like the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. This is the cradle of India's atomic energy program the Tata Memorial Hospital for Cancer Research and Treatment. We had one in Bombay, and now we are sort of putting one in, in Calcutta. Uh, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, the National Center of Performing Arts, and, and the National Institute of Advanced Studies. Now, in the National Center of Performing Arts, it really needs to mention that there's Jamshedji Baba, who, again, followed exa exactly the principles that Dorab and Ratan Tata had did. All his wealth he put towards this uh, Institute of Performing Arts, which is uh, based in Bombay, and that really is the one, first one of its kind. Today, as you all know, the Tata Group is much larger, and it's a global footprint. The trusts have grown in size, and together disperse 500 crores. That would be about... Uh, other stuff, how much would that be? Quite a lot. <laughs> Every year, providing support to individual by way of in individual scholarship, medical relief, promoting institution and pioneering domains by way of institutional grants, addresses poverty in a kind of way which um, doesn't sort of make it exist more poverty today, less tomorrow. It sort of tries to sort of eradicate poverty. And to end, I would just like to conclude with the words of G.R. Miller. It's not, having, it's not having that makes men great. A man may have the largest abundance of God's gift, of money, of, of mental acquirements, of power, of heart, possessions, and qualities. Yet, he's only, yet if he only hoards what he has for himself, he is not great. Men are great only in the measure in which they use what they have to bless others. We are God's stewards, and the gifts that come to us are his, not ours, and are to be used for him as he would use them. In this lies the true essence of trusteeship and true essence of philanthropy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Um, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the hashtag. Those of you who were twittering, the uh, address is hashtag LSE Focus on India. I didn't know we were going to be on Twitter, actually. That makes things more difficult. Um, you know, it's interesting to come up and have a speech prepared where you're going to have essentially three things to say. And two of those are already illustrated. It's either very convenient or very terrifying. Um, I'll try and be a bit more general, though. Um, drawing a bit on um, research we did uh, last year on philanthropy in Asia, and what, what I'd like to do is talk about how or what we've learned about philanthropy's past, its present, and some challenges we see in the future. Um, but, you know, since we have a question on the screen, I'll bring forth another question that was published in The Guardian exactly one year ago. This was an article that's titled, Is Philanthropy Taking Off in India? So essentially exact opposite of what you have here. And it starts by saying, rich Indians have been better at giving their time than their money. But British aid won't last forever. Now, given India's defense choices, that day may come sooner than we expect. Um, but the article assumes that philanthropy in India hasn't taken off, or that it needs to take off. So that's, that's where I'd like to start with. Because it's generally accepted that India, and in fact much of Asia, has more of a tradition of religious giving um, than of organized philanthropy as we understand it today, modern day philanthropy. Um, 
But if you look closely, that's not really true. Much of modern day India, and I think we've heard so many examples here of uh, the work of the Tata family, much of modern day India was built on philanthropy. Um, social reform movements prior to independence, the independence movement itself, and a lot of the infrastructure of a free independent India were all bankrolled, first by progressive royalty and then by industrialists. Education keeps coming up, so let's take the example of women's education, which was a big issue for social reformers in the early 20th century. This was largely funded by private money. Uh, in 1899, the Begum of Murshidabad was sponsoring and advocating for um, change on this issue by sponsoring public debate. Uh, in Punjab, a lot of reform movements were funded by commercial groups that went out and set up separate schools for girls. Uh, India's first women's university was set up through philanthropy. So in a number of fields, there's been a significant impact historically in India on um, social reform, on independence, and what followed. But what's also remarkable is how little is known about this. You know, when we talk about philanthropy, we're often seeing it as a Western construct. Um, in our interviews um, during our research, some of the people we spoke to mentioned Carnegie and Rockefeller as um, their role models. Um, and we often see them or Joseph Rowentree, Carl Zeiss, Robert Bosch as leaders of their time. But essentially, Jamshedji Tata was a contemporary and a peer of Joseph Rowentree. They were essentially setting up the same models in England and in India at the same time in 1904. A more recent example would be that of the Giving Pledge. The trend today in the West is very much to pledge your wealth while you're alive. And this Guardian article essentially suggests Indians to aspire to, to sign up to that pledge. But we've learned that the concept of trusteeship actually goes a lot further than that. It doesn't depend on tax or inheritance tax or estate tax um, to encourage giving. So Indians have been giving a lot more and going much further than pledging for over 100 years. And that's something, again, that seems to have, um, have been missed by a lot of observers. Now, the second point I'd like to cover is about what we see happening today. If India had a very strong, very sort of avant-garde group of givers in the past, what we've seen is that in the last 20 years, there's been, again, a very healthy revival. There's been a number of uh, people who've come forward. And essentially, as a result of economic growth and liberalization, established, grown new businesses, which has led to more uh, giving and more philanthropy. But what's different this time around is and particularly compared to, um, let's say, Europe and the US, is that a lot of, there's a very thin line between family philanthropy or private philanthropy and corporate giving. Indians tend to involve multiple generations in their uh, philanthropy. Um, they are hiring people from the businesses to run their foundations, which may very well be um, funded through corporate donations. But what's also interesting is that quite a few of them apply the same principles of running a business and therefore build extremely professional, very high quality institutions. Interestingly, some of the organizations we spoke to were incorporated as charitable companies and have been for several decades. Now, this is a concept that's just emerged in the UK and in the US. They also have performance-related pay. They do impact measurement, and they're not shy of campaigning for change. Again, practices we typically associate with professional Western, let's say, Western organizations. So again, we're seeing that just like their predecessors, a number of organizations and individuals today tend to be very avant-garde, very 
um, innovative in their use of philanthropy. Now, everything is not obviously hunky-dory. Um, we do in, see in terms of um, the evolution of the sector a few challenges ahead. And that's what I would like to conclude with. There's a lot of richness in terms of what people are doing, but there are two trends that will need to be resolved um, before the sector can grow too much. For one, the motivations and the values that underlie philanthropy are changing. Um, the cost concept of trusteeship was very strong pre-independence. I'm not sure to what extent it still um, holds the same sort of um, emotional, let's say, um, um, the same sort of, it, it gets the same sort of emotional response from philanthropists today. But the current generation has been very, I would say, socialist in their mindset. And they, they tend to be skeptical of capitalism as a solution to inequality, which is different from what you see in the West. The trend is very much towards free enterprise and scalable solutions. But it's unclear how the next generation will perceive their role, whether they will have the same values, and whether they will choose to use the same tools for socioeconomic justice. And the second thing we also see is that philanthropists in India don't engage and talk very openly with the, with the broader nonprofit sector. Um, they've been very good in the past and today at building their own institutions. Um, and at the moment, we see most of them building, operating rather than grant making foundations, not just in India, across Asia. But to one, for one reason, for this might well be that there is a, um, a certain pride in the work of philanthropy, um, the work that it involves, uh, and a desire to be involved in the process. The more troubling reason, and this was reflected in a, couple, in a number of conversations, was there's a mutual distrust between nonprofits and NGOs on the one hand and philanthropists and their foundations on the other. Philanthropists are generally skeptical of the quality, the professionalism, and the transparency of NGOs, uh, perhaps with good reason. But NGOs on their, on their part are also extremely suspicious of corporate agendas. And for a sector that still has a lot to scale and a lot to grow, that obviously getting these two together um, is a challenge that needs to be addressed. Now, I'm going to stop with that. Um, I think the one common thread that I can safely conclude on is that while there is a traditional view of philanthropy in India being religious giving and traditional charity, it's always also been characterized by a group of people who have been all very innovative, very avant-garde, and compare very well with their, with their peers of that time anywhere else in the world. That's it. Thanks to all the speakers. But, and before I open it to questions, I just want to um, summarize a few things. Uh, one of the thing, one thing I would like us to think about is why do people give? Um, some have said that giving is random. Perhaps we can ask Mr. Nadar here when we open the floor to why does he want to give? We've also heard the phrases such as um, there's greater pleasure in giving than in receiving. Um, people like James Andrioni and others have referred to uh, this hypothesis as a warm glow when people give. Um, my own inspiration for, um, of giving or philanthropy comes from the parable of the widow's might. I don't know if you're all familiar with this. Um, it's a story of um, um, Jesus watching people giving in the temple in Jerusalem. He sees all the rich people going and kind of very proudly putting things into the money box. And then he sees a very simple widow having nothing, but then she goes and puts her mite in. I don't know, maybe a mite was equivalent of 
10 pence or maybe a pound. Um, and then Jesus tells the people there, saying, what that woman has given is much more than anything that the rest of them have given today. My inspiration of giving comes from that. And I'm always, um, and I do believe that people can give in so many different ways. It's time, it's talent, it's money. And uh, one of the things I've also seen in British society is how people give. Even people who have just average incomes give hugely to charities or causes around the world from what little they have. And that's very encouraging. And also I've seen lots of young people, and I would say LSE young people, spend quite a lot of time in volunteering. And this culture, I think, is picking up in other parts of the world. Indian students now do a lot of voluntary work before they go into their universities. I had Chinese students in China uh, tell me stories about how they are learning to go and do voluntary work as well. With that, I will stop and then open the floor for questions. Maybe I'll start with asking Mr. Nadar why, what makes him give? I was quite frank in admitting that this had to be a nudge from my mother. It did not come quite naturally to me. But having said that, uh, I found that building institutions in this area have not been very many examples or models are very few to follow or imbibe. And I wanted to carry it through because all the only thing I've done in my life is to create institutions. And uh, I thought I'd try and institutionalize this process. And second, why I talk about this outside? Earlier on, I never talked about this outside. Only in the last two or three years, I started talking about this. Because people came and asked me that it's, it's a great role model, what you're setting, and if you go about doing this publicly, maybe others will also do. And if others do, in what form can you help them build models? Are you going to take money from them? So we again thought about it a lot, debated it a lot, and felt that Ideally, we should create certain part of what we do in transferring this model to others. What it mean is, someone else wants to come and build another school similar to what we do. We should be able to transfer that. Surprisingly, uh, there are very wealthy families who have come and asked us after that, Say that, can you help us build one? Somebody came from Punjab and said, can you help us build one? Now, we didn't have an answer because we just about managed to build it ourselves. Now, it's not a very scalable one, but definitely transferable one. So, I learned a lot in institution building. Redoing that is very challenging and very satisfying. One simple, selfish reason, very satisfying. <laughs> That's the thing about get greater pleasure in giving than in receiving. Actually, it's not giving. I like to use a different word, sharing. Yes. Maybe we can take two or three questions at a time. The first question for the lady at the back. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. My name's um, Tiffany. I work for Magic Bus, which some of you might have heard of. Um, it's a large Indian-based um, organisation. I run the UK office, which is purely fundraising. Um, so it's very interesting to hear you talk, because obviously there are some amazing philanthropists in India and a lot of um, big companies. You know, Tata's famous for, for what it does. Um, one of the challenges we have, which is why we have a UK fundraising office, mm -hmm. is trying to engage with corporates in India. Um, we are supported by the Indian government, we're supported by international, you know, very large corporates such as Barclays, Premier League, Comic Relief. So we have the credibility and we have a, a lot of people interested in our program in India. Um, we work with 200,000 children in communities in an outdoor education and female empowerment program. Um, 
but, but we find it very difficult to translate that into support. And I'm just interested to hear from, from the panel if you feel that there is a shift in, you know, maybe more companies in India taking on a kind of corporate social responsibility policy. At the moment, we find that working with some international companies, they, they want their India office to start giving, but actually even they, as the UK or US-based office, find it hard to get the India office to volunteer as well as to, to fund. Um, so I'm just interested if you see a kind of a turn in the tide on that one, because I would definitely say, like, as an NGO, we're not suspicious at all of the corporates. We welcome them with open arms. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, because of shortage of time, I'd request you to keep your questions fairly brief. The gentleman there, and then the lady in the middle here. Here, just. Did you hear that? Critical much? thinking and. Uh, questioning authorities. Questioning. Okay. Not yet there. You know. I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, you know, these children from the background from which they come from, uh, I saw the boy, you know, I don't get to see them as well. He's just turning and saying that, uh, he says this in Hindi, so I don't know whether you followed that. Ankita, the girl who stood first, he said, I'm going to beat her in the final exam. They come from a background which is very compassionate. and. For once, I see this boy not only getting competitive, but also getting very combative. Uh, that's as far as they have gone. They have not gone to questioning, questioning authority, not yet. But we are going to imbibe that. You know, we, we are certainly going to imbibe that. But this is also a component. It's a very good question because it's also a question. component. Very, very good yeah. question. It's but this comes up in higher education, yeah. in the uh, school not yet, but in college, the one which is in the South, they question anything. The lady in the middle here. Um, this question is for Mr. Nader again. Um, so though I am a student uh, here, um, back in India, I was working with rural schools in the southern part of India, and um, I was doing this along with my mother, with you know, with the aim of trying to revamp what is going on there because the core of the society comes from the grassroots, with the very same thing. And um, I found out that the general notion of people, of youngsters towards education or working in you know that aspect is they don't find it as attractive as working in an MNC or trying to, you know, uh, it, it, education is a professional industry just like how IT or law is. So in what way could youngsters be inspired to contribute something, the cream of the society be inspired to contribute something to education? Because I would need a lot of help with people of my age to come with me because I know I can do a lot of, if two of us could reach out to 200 schools, if there were 20 of us we could reach out to many schools. So in what way do you think youngsters could be inspired to take up education philanthropy in India? We'll take both uh, answers to both the questions. It's a, it's a very difficult question. We all struggle with it. I know the government of India struggles with it. Uh, how do you attract people, young people particularly? They think, at least, one thought was it is the remunerativeness of the profession. But that no longer exists. You know, the Sixth Pay Commission equates teachers to, you know, a teacher in a school, her or his salary is the same as the starting salary of an Indian Administrative Service Officer. And it is the same as a salary as every top company, Tata Consulting Services, Infosys, HCL, Wipro, all of us start at the same salary. But yet it is not attracting. It's because you don't grow fast enough. Okay. I, I wish there was a solution. For engineering schools, I think there will be a solution. But I don't know about the rest. Engineering schools is because they will start participating in the industry that gets created as out of that. 
you know, the models that are created in Stanford in the 60s, and then from there off, you know, the uh, new ventures participating with universities of the IPR created in the university. The first good one has been created in the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras. And I think one in Bangalore, Bombay is reasonably good. But the gap is colossal. There are 700,000 teachers. Very big gap. Um, we'll ask Mr. Hassan and Weep to answer the first question. You know, I forgot to mention the um, philanthropy, uh, what the Tatas do, is uh, mostly through their trust. But there is a whole lot of um, CSR work that individual companies do. And I would say that uh, sort of given the next five to ten years, the kind of the amounts that are increasing, I think you probably have a matching 500 crores that's being done uh, through on the CSR business. So to answer your question as to whether there is uh, CSR that's being done, I think it's happening more than ever on the Indian corporates. So it's really a question of getting a corporate to support a particular charity. And that charity also, I think it kind of needs to fit in with basically what their CSR is all about. Now, for instance, Tata's, most of the CSR is done around the place where you have our factories. I mean, for instance, in Jamshedpur, there was nothing. It was just a place where two rivers met, and that's where the steel plant came up. Now, our philosophy on that is that you can't have an oasis of goodness where there's going to be deprivation and, and, you know, and uh, uh, poverty all around. So within an within a area of 30 kilometers on each side, they go in for all the works that will enable people to sort of make them more useful to society, to enable them to sort of use their livelihood. So that is for companies where brick and mortar, chemicals, mortars, uh, steel. But most of the newer companies that have come up, they are probably more urban oriented. And in these urban oriented situations, I think there is tremendous amount of potential for charities like the Magic Bus to be supported, and I think it would be part of uh, part of what they need to do as a government, as a as a guiding philosophy of the group. I can only sort of um, add to that. I think um, traditionally two things uh, about CSR. One, there's been a um, CSR or corporate, let's say, engagement has been very community driven by a lot of companies. So, you know, if you're looking for uh, engagement with corporates, you have to go local. Uh, and the second thing is there seems to be a good correlation between the professionalization of a business and sort of how professional the CSR or the, um, the community um, engagement activities are. Um, and that's another sort of clear driver for you to know where to, uh, who to engage with. Don't have that. I think we have time for one more round of three questions. The lady there. Can you speak? Okay, yeah, yeah, sure.
Can I answer that? Because that's a very good question. Uh, what do we do with the five weakest students? Okay. Here, uh, I just want you to know, we've set up, I'm still in first generation. So there's only this much that we, whatever we've built, we've built off, you know, what only the state could possibly afford to do something like this. Uh, there is a limitation of what we can do. However, it's not that the problem does not exist. What you're saying is real. It's a real problem. And not only for them, education for them, but also the education for what happens to those who just pass because he, he or she is 18 and never was educated. We can't just say that we're going to abandon them for the rest of their lives. It's a very fundamental necessity, right? We can only create a model. So it's not yet done. That's why we never spoke about this. In foundation, we do many other things on the basis of creative philanthropy. We built a university. We have built two schools, which is meant for the cities. But all of them tend to be meant only for the leaders. So what do we do for the rest? There is a new program, which is envisaged for this year. We're just waiting for the elections in UP to be over. Because the state government has agreed to do this with us. And any state government will agree to do this with us. We are going to build, a, we are going to take over initially 100 schools, okay, in which all, including the weakest. You know, my own theory is that maths is something in which I don't know how you can score 85% or how you can score 40%. Either you score hundred percent or you score zero, okay. <laughs> because either you know it's it's a very derivable piece. Okay. You take any grammar, either you are correct or or you are wrong. You can't be in between, no. You have ten so, questions. <laughs> if you hit zero or hundred on each question, then it adds up to eighty or forty. No, maths is fundamental. <laughs> no, maths is fundamental. You know, it's built on additions and subtractions. If you go to any maths, finally it will go down to that. That's how computer logic is built on that. <laughs> so, uh, we are drawing a program called Shiksha. Shiksha will take over these 100 schools. And in these schools will form models. How education would be brought up to this binary condition. No, not no. We <coughs> hope, we don't know the answers, but we are going to find the answers. Along with that, we are setting up a training school and working out with the government that we will trans, translocate this model to any of the schools for any of the students. But it's an experiment which is in the works, undertaken someone in his 20s with a great deal of passion for this. Uh, Robin Sarkar will be doing this job. And this is one project which I'm going to go see personally. I didn't get the first question really fully well. If you can just. If I can explain that, you know, we believe that philanthropy can be two kinds. One is corrective philanthropy, another is creative philanthropy. <laughs> corrective philanthropy is the government spends vast sums of money creating the schools and in which a series of corrections are required. We considered it whether we should do it even at the first round because the impact can be big, the can, impact can be multiple, the numbers affected will be very large. We thought either we do it ourselves or do it through leaderships that we create. That's why we went through creation first and the corrections later. You know, as much span of attention could take. I think um, we have to stop now because we have this other um, networking session uh, after this. I'd like to thank um, various people who have helped put this together, the career services, which is also following after this with the networking, the SPICE Society, the Indian Society. In fact, this is the first time we've been able to locate the careers day and this panel within the India Week, and we had an inaugural yesterday of the India Week with Rishi Kapoor, no less. Um, and um, 
the last thing I want to show you is all these other companies which are waiting outside uh, and have, might have already started networking with uh, students. This is to this was all inspired for us to sort of encourage diversity in the workplace with, through the LSE's um, international student community. I believe we have um, more countries represented at the LSE than the UN itself. So. What, where else can we have that, uh, enable diversity in the workplace? So please stay, stay back and meet these people outside. And I'd like to thank all the speakers.